Amen, amen, amen. Let's give Jesus a big hand. Can we do that? Let's give him some praise. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you. We thank you for your goodness and your glory. Thank you, Father, for pouring your spirit out in a new way in this place. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, give him one more praise. Can we do it? Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Look at someone and tell them God is up to some good stuff. Amen. Praise God. Joanne and I are just so honored to be here. And we're honored to be able to be a part of what God is doing, not just on the Sunshine Coast, but in this nation. Do you know that God's going to use you to affect this nation? Amen. Not just so you can have life easy, but because God wants to bless the generations coming after you as well. Amen? I'm just so thankful. This has been a crazy transition, uh, and, it's, and, and the more we do it, we understand it's not about us, it's about Him. And we just get the privilege of being able to be a part of what God's doing and what God's pouring out here in Australia. Uh, many of you uh, may remember when we were here last, we gave a, a, a little bit of testimony about what, you know, our connection with Australia. I was almost born here. You may say, well, how are you almost born somewhere? Well, my parents were actually in the 60s going to come and homestead here in Australia. They were doing that thing back then. I don't know if they still do it now. If they do, I need to sign up for it. But uh, it, they were doing it then. They were getting ready to move, and uh, I was born, and my grandmother fell in love with me and wouldn't let them leave. Uh, later on in life, she tried to send them away, but uh, that's a whole nother sermon. Amen. <laughs> and then when I was 17, I was filled with the Holy Spirit in a church in Tupelo, Mississippi, who, uh, where I was raised up spiritually as well, and the night I received the Holy Spirit, God spoke to me and He said, Greg, I want to use you mightily in two nations of the earth. And one was the Philippines, and I heard Him as loud and as clear as you're hearing me today. And He said, the other one is Australia. It took us, took me rather, 10 years after God gave me that word to get to the Philippines. And I mean, you know, the Bible says when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. Hallelujah. I, find my, I found my Filipino baby. And uh, we were married. Uh, I don't recommend the courtship that we had to anybody. We spent about six hours together, and I asked her to marry me. There's no need waiting around when God says something. Amen. And it's been like that with this. Uh, 33 years later, uh, we wound up here in, in Australia, and we came. But we wanted to move at that time, but it just didn't happen. Went back, set some things in order. Joanne and I oversee churches in Hawaii, Alaska, up and down the West Coast, uh, Philippines. We have churches in Korea that we oversee. And we just had to get things in order with the churches in Hawaii. When you live in paradise, you're a little harder to organize than you are the rest of the world. But uh, we got things in order, got those pastors there ready. They're doing things today. And uh, we thank God for uh, being able to make this transition so quick. When we were here last, Neil and I uh, and Joanne and, and Nancy sat across the table from each other, and this thing just popped out. And it was instant, wasn't it, Neil? It was so God. And uh, that morning, Joanne and I were talking to each other about the move and about what we were asking God to do. And then at lunch that day, Neil was like he was in our bedroom hearing our conversation. And what he said was what we talked about. And we just looked at each other and like, amazing. This is what God is doing. And others, some of you in here, God used you without knowing anything to confirm what Neil and Nancy and Joe and I had been talking about at lunch, and we had been talking about with each other. And to make a long story short, here we are, and we're praising God, amen, for being able to be a part of what God is doing in your life and what God is doing on the Sunshine Coast 
and what God is doing in this great nation of Australia. I really believe that God's birthing a movement and awakening in this nation from right here in the Sunshine Coast. Amen? And He's not doing it with one man or He's not doing it with two men. He's doing it with His body. He's bringing His body into a place to where we are going together to see the awakening of the Lord in this nation right down from our personal lives to our families, our children, our communities, and to see what God has destined Australia to do. I said last night that I believe that God's going to use this nation to be one of the greatest kingdom-sending ambassador nations in the world. Do you believe that today? Amen. We need to agree on that because the Word of the Lord says, where two or three agree, touching anything, it will be done. Hallelujah. Now, this morning, I want to give you a word that I feel like God has laid in my heart for 2020 and beyond. And I had a beautiful uh, notes all laid out, and the, the, the tech demon got in everything this morning. No, it was probably me pushing the wrong buttons. But uh, uh, Jason, I think, is going to help me back there. He wrote me something a while ago. I couldn't read his writing. What happened? It's on Messenger. I cannot open Messenger in my iPad. Praise the Lord. But we'll follow along together with the video there, or with the uh, PowerPoint there. And I don't use it a lot, but I did feel very strongly to create a PowerPoint today to help us walk through what the Lord is saying to us. We've entered into the 20s. And whenever we stepped in the 20s, the Lord spoke to me that it's going to be the roaring 20s. Everybody say the roaring 20s. Now, I don't know in Australia back in the 1920s if you called it the roaring 20s then, but in America they did, and I just heard the Lord say again that this is going to be the roaring 20s. Not just the year, but the decade is going to be poured out in a way that we've never seen it been poured out before in our lives. I really believe in my heart that we're going to see more people born again than we've ever seen in the history of the world in this next decade. I believe your family's coming in. I believe your children. Amen. I believe your, your extended family. Hallelujah. Even the werewolf you marry is going to get saved. Amen. That's a joke. Praise the Lord. God, that's not a joke, Neil said. Praise the Lord. But we're entering into a season or a year of the harvest. Look at someone next to you and tell them, welcome to the Roaring Twenties. In the book of Hosea, chapter 11 and verse 10, we could put that slide up there. It says this. It says, they will walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. Indeed, he will roar, and his sons will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like the birds from Egypt, like the doves of the lands of Assyria, and I will settle them in their houses declares the Lord. Here's what God's releasing in your life this year. Number one, He's releasing a settling in your life. Things that have been topsy-turvy, things that have been all messed up, things that have been chaotic, I believe in my heart that God, by His Spirit, is beginning to breathe on our lives. He's beginning to breathe into our families, and God is bringing a peace in your home. Can you say amen about that? The Scripture says that God gives us a peace that passes all understanding. And people will look at you and they'll say, the economy looks horrible. The government's acting nuts again. Everything in the world is, is being turned upside down, nation against nation. How can you not be nervous? And you can say, Jesus is the peace of my life. And no matter what's breaking loose in the world, it doesn't mean it doesn't that you don't have peace in your life in the midst of all the trouble in the world. The second thing it says here that God's going to roar. He's going to roar over your life in this year. What does it mean to roar? Well, if you've ever watched any of those National Geographic films where the lions begin to hunt, the lion, he crouches down, and he begins to roar, and that roar goes across the prairie. And everything that is in that prairie, in the sound of his roar, its ears perk up. 
its tails go up in the air and they begin to run for cover. The lionesses, they're the ones that go out and they begin to hunt and to bring the spoil back into the pride so that the pride can eat. When I begin to think about that, I felt the Spirit of the Lord say to me that the roar of God is going to begin to stir up everything in your life and things that don't need to begin to be there are going to begin to run away. I mean, know the devil, the Bible says the devil will come against you one way, but he will flee seven different ways. We're in the season of the enemy fleeing out of your life. You may say, Greg, how can, how can all that happen? I, I, do I need to fast? Do I need to pray? Do I need to, to give more? Do I need to come to church? You need to do all these things. But this is God's part in your progression in life. He's going to roar over you. Hallelujah. And the enemy's going to flee. But there are going to be things that God's going to cause you to run after in the roar. And as you run after those things in the roar, you're going to begin to get a harvest you couldn't get without the roar. Ah, hallelujah. Your God is going to loose things that have been held for you to go and for you to reap. Amen. Some of you in here, you need financial breakthrough. You need breakthroughs in your marriage. You need breakthroughs in your business. Just give God permission to begin to roar His Word over your life. Can you say amen? When God roars, it's going to bring some things into order. Let's go to that next slide. When we looked at the word roar, Joanne gave me this acronym for roar. And it is this, restoring order and royalty. Woo! God's roar is going to begin to restore Man, I've been on this thing of studying the re's. A lot of re-words, restore, recalibrate, amen, reposition, realign. When you see the word re, it means to put back something that was there in the beginning. There are things that are, were stored up for you, and they were either squandered, not in here, praise God. Maybe people watching over the internet squander theirs, but we didn't squander ours. Hallelujah. It might have been stolen. It might have been lost. It might have been used. And God's bringing back into your life. He's restoring, refilling you, bringing back what He intended for you to have in the beginning. And the two things that I felt Holy Spirit speak to me about was, number one, order. The roar of God over your life is bringing order to you. How many know that God loves order? He does things that are decently and in order. Even the, the scripture that most of us know very, very well, John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world. That word world is the word cosmos. And the word cosmos means order. For God so loved order that He gave His only begotten Son, and if you would believe in Him, you would not perish as things are being set in order, but you would have everlasting life. Wow! Jesus came to restore order so that the kingdom of God could be reestablished and you and I could be repositioned in the place that God intended for us to be originally, and that is in royalty. You're royalty this morning. Amen. You're kings and queens this morning. You're not sinners trying to make it to heaven the best way you can. That's not who you are. You were a sinner. You've been saved by grace, and you've been given assignment by Father in His royal family. You are king. He is the king of you, the kings. He is the Lord of you, the lords. God's restoring order and royalty. When I use the word royalty here, it literally does mean to become king. We'll look at another verse about that shortly. But what does it have to do with and deal with in our life this morning? It has to do with identity. We have a big identity problem in the church. Maybe not in Australia, but Hawaii has a big identity problem. Neil said we got it here too. 
in this season what God's going to do in us. He's going to break off of us the false identities that have been put on us by the world, that have been put on us by our families. Some of you have been raised and you've been told you're never going to be nothing. You won't amount to anything. You'll never achieve anything. You might as well not even be here. People have walked out of some of your lives because they say you're, you don't have it together. You don't know who you are. You're doing things wrong in life. I want you to know today that God is going to begin to restore your identity and bring you into a place of sonship where you can begin to function as God intended for you to function. Amen. You're not just some weak sinner trying to live the best way you can and get to heaven. You are sons and daughters of God. You have the anointing and the power of God on your life. You have an inheritance from your Father, and it is to be used in this earth to bring about His will, and that is the reestablishing of His kingdom through you. Look at somebody and say, you're royalty. You need to see it. Tell them you need to see it. Hallelujah. God spoke this phrase to me early this year, and it's on our next slide. And it says this, God does not desire to wow you as a mystical being from way out in the universe somewhere, but He desires to wow you as a good father. Many people see God as this mystical being way out somewhere in the universe, <clears throat> that it takes actually an act of God for them to get to God. And they're looking for God to do something mystical in their life. But God doesn't want to wow you as a mystical God. He wants to wow you as a good father. Can you say amen? When you come into your identity, you will begin to see God not as this judge way up in heaven ready to whack you over the head with a stick when you mess up, but you'll see him as a good, good father. You'll see him as a good daddy, Abba, father, one that has your best interest in mind, one that has your life laid out before you. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. God has been dreaming about you. God has been planning for you. God has been ordering your steps. Can somebody say amen? You're not living this thing on a whim. God has mapped it out. When we come into our identity and step into royalty, we'll be able to have our feet as the righteous ordered by Him. Hallelujah. Somebody say, God, wow me as a good father. Hallelujah. Here's another verse God gave me. Write this one down, Haggai 2 and 9. <clears throat> Neil, this is very important word for what God has used you to do in this nation. This is a prophetic word for you. For what you've put your hands to, God said He's going to honor your labor. He's honoring what you've done. And the vineyard that you labored, God said, I'm going to give you a vineyard that's bearing more fruit than the one that did before. And He gave me this verse for you today. Haggai chapter 2 and 9. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former glory, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. He said what you've seen before is not going to compare to what you're getting ready to see. Hallelujah. And he said, he said the glory, everybody say glory. glory. Now you got to say it like a redneck. Say glory. glory. There you go. Praise God. The word glory literally in the, in the Hebrew, it means kabod. Everybody say kabod. And the word kabod means weight. The weight of God was, is in this place today. In worship, you could feel the weight of God, the presence of God in this house. And the weight of something, those that bear that weight, it's not only evidence that that weight is there, but other people can see them bearing under that burden of the weight. God is saying to us that the weight of His glory, the weight of His anointing that has been evident in our life in the past, will not compare to the weight of His glory that He's getting ready to set on us even now. And others will begin to recognize your shift and your transition into a deeper place in God. 
into a deeper walk with Father, not as a judge, not as a, a divine being way out there, but as your Father, you're going to begin to carry the kabod of God, the weight of God in a way you've never carried it before. When you have that on you, if there's enough weight, it's difficult to walk. Right? If I were to bring Neil up here today, and I'm not going to do it, I love him too much to do this, and I were to sit on his shoulders, and I were to say, Neil, run around the room, you'll say, there's no way I can do it. You're a big boy, and you ain't getting on my shoulders. But if I were, Neil could say, the weight or the kabod, the glory of Greg, is upon me. I got a lot of glory, praise God. And he would, he would bear under that weight, that kabod. And this is what God is saying. I'm going to set my kabod, my glory, my weight in your life, that it's literally going to affect the way that you walk and you bear burden. Oh, hallelujah. See, burdens are not bad when they're the right burden to bear. And carrying the weight of God on your life, the presence of Father. See, what God's doing, and I believe He's starting in here today, is that He's shifting us out of a place that we have been coming to church into a place that we're being the church. That what you're getting here and what you're carrying in your life, you're going to bear under that where you live where you work, where you function, and the glory of God, the kabod of God that is on you is going to change where you live. Because God hasn't blessed you so you could have an easy life. He has blessed you so you can expand His kingdom and be used of Him. And when you die and leave this earth, everything about you should have been spent. Leaving nothing in you. Everything that God's assigned you to has been completed. Can somebody help me and say amen? God gave me some 2020 scriptures. Now, I, I, I think, you know, sometimes people get all this stuff and they say, you know, trying to tie it in. But God began to say, I want you to look at some 2020 scriptures. How many know that when you go to your eye doctor and he says you've got 2020 vision, that's a good thing. Amen. You don't like me. You don't get trifocals. I want eyes like Neil's. He's 80 years old, and I ain't see him wearing glasses. I'm 51, and I, I need three pair in one. But whenever the doctor says, you have 20-20 vision, that's perfect vision. And we're coming into the year 2020. We're in it. And God's increasing the ability for you to see clearer than you've ever seen and further than you've ever seen and more discernment than you've ever had in your life. Begin to expect it. And it's not just cliche because it's 2020. It's the Word of the Lord for us. We're in a season that is releasing His vision within us. The first one God gave me is Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 20. And it says here, Sanctify, watch this, Sanctify my Sabbath and my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. He said, sanctify my Sabbaths. But we know now that Jesus is our Sabbath. We're not going to start meeting on Saturdays. I mean, that's not what we're saying. Hallelujah. We may, but it's not because of that. Jesus is our Sabbath. He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled it. All of the fulfillment of the law is in Christ Jesus. And He's saying to us that we should begin to sanctify Jesus our Sabbath, every day is a sanctified day in our life. We're not just looking at Sunday to fulfill a religious obligation to God so that maybe He'll be good to us this week. Every day is a kingdom day. Every day is Jesus' day. Every day is a day of assignment that God is going to pour Himself through you in a way if you'll sanctify that day and give it to Him. Can you say amen? Deuteronomy 20.20 20. This is a phenomenal verse, and when God showed it to me, it blew my mind. Only Look look at this. Only the trees which you know are not fruit trees. Look at that good. Only the trees which you know are not fruit trees 
you shall destroy and cut down. That they may be that you may construct seg works against the city that is making war with you until it falls. God is saying to us that there are two types of trees in our life. There are trees that bear fruit, and there are trees that don't bear fruit. And he said, begin to examine your life, and the trees in your life, the things in your life that are not bearing fruit, God said, cut them down. Because God wants to use those things, not as failures, not as things that you cut down and say, well, I finally got that thing out of my life, or that thing's not going to bother me anymore. But God said, actually, take those things that have not bore fruit in your life and build a siege work, use them to ram against the cities that are coming against you making war until they fall. The things in your life that look unfruitful are things that God actually wants to use to build a fortress in your life so that the things that the enemy's been coming against you with will fall. Woo! Yeah, the devil thought he got you in that one. He thought he wounded you in this one. He thought he caused you to fail and to fall in that. But all that he was doing, it was creating trees that were not meant for fruit. Those trees are going to be used as siege works against what he's doing so that what he is doing will fall in your life. It's like saying that the things, amen, it's like saying that the things that he sent into your camp, you're using it to send back into his camp. And the things that were meant to destroy you, it's going to be turned again to the camp of the enemy, and the camp of the enemy is going to be destroyed. In this year, God's saying, don't look at your failures as failures. Cut them down. Build a siege work against the enemy until he falls. Hallelujah. Praise God. Exodus 20, 20. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Look at somebody and say, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. For God has come in order to test you. And in order that the fear of Him, God, may remain with you so that you may not sin. We are entering into a place where prophetic words over our lives are coming to pass. You're looking at a 33-year-old prophetic word coming to pass before your eyes right now. Amen. Please give the Lord a praise for that. Hallelujah. But it has not been without test. The things in your life that God spoke over you, God's going to test them. He's going to put it through some things to mature you. Amen? Whenever a car manufacturer builds a car, or Apple builds an iPhone or an iPad, or a manufacturer makes something, they don't just make it and say, go do what I had in my mind for you to do. No, they're put through a battery of tests to make sure that that product operates as the designer and the developer intended for it to do. Before Apple puts their One Bite Apple logo out on this phone, it has been through many tests. It's been through many trials. They've tried to crash it. They've tried to crush it. They've tried to see if it'll survive underwater. They did all of these things. Why? Because the manufacturer's reputation is on the success of his product, and if his product does not succeed, his business will go bust. Likewise, our Father, who has made you, He has put His name on you. He has put His word on you. He has put His reputation on you. And He will put you through a battery of tests to make sure that you operate with the manufacturer's expectations so that when you are gone out into the public to perform, His name will be made great. Hallelujah! So all of the hell that you've been going through, 
all of the crap that's been dumped on your porch has not been for naught. You have been in research and development phase. God is moving you into performance phase. God is shifting you into the place that He has desired in His heart for you to function. So get ready. The logo of God is being stamped on you and you are being commissioned for service in His kingdom. Whoa! Glory to God. Yeah, you thought God forgot you. No, He was pressuring you. You thought God had given up. No, you were in test mode. You thought God had, had forsaken you and was trying to destroy you. He will never forsake you, but He is trying to kill you. Amen. you got to understand, as great as the call is on your life, whether it's in ministry or ministry of business, or ministry of government, or as an educator, or whatever it may be. God wants to send you out in a place of preparedness and ready. Not perfect, but in a place that He has got the kinks out and worked the bugs out in your life. That, But when you step out and say, I have come in the name of the King, His name will not be tarnished. Amen. And people won't ask for a refund. A lot of people today are looking at the church and they're saying, I want a refund. What they said was not, it did not operate the, same, the way they said it would operate. But God is shifting us out of religious expectations into kingdom manifestations. Can you say amen? Whoa, I got to hurry up. Amen. Praise God. The next one, 1 Samuel 20 and 20. He says here, this is Jonathan and David. I love their story. They were great friends. Look what it says. I will shoot three arrows to the side as though I shot at a target. I will shoot three arrows to the side as I, have, as I would have shot at a target. Now to understand that verse, we've got to understand the context. Saul wanted to kill David. Jonathan loved David with all of his heart. They had a great relationship. And David had been anointed the king. And Saul didn't want him to have the throne. And he was being sent to minister to Saul. He would play for Saul, play his harp and sing, and, and demons would manifest in Saul, and Saul would throw spears at him and try to kill him. Worship team, thank you for your anointing. We will not throw spears. Hallelujah. But... Jonathan knew that, da that Saul wanted to set David up and kill him. And Jonathan loved David so much, and he said, David, I want you to watch. I'm going to shoot three arrows like I'm target practicing. And if they go to the left, you're okay to come. If they go to the right, please don't come. It's a trap, and you'll be killed. When I read that, Neil, God's saying that He's going to begin to give us supernatural relationships with people that will look out for us when we are even about to take what is rightfully theirs. Jonathan had the right to the throne, but David was anointed to sit there. Jonathan could have said, David, you ain't taking what's mine, buddy. I was born for this. This is mine and you can't have it and tried to kill him. But no, the Bible says that Jonathan loved David. There are going to be people that come into your life that are sitting in a place that you're supposed to be promoted to. And they're going to say, take my seat. It's rightfully mine, but you're anointed for it. God may have you sitting in some seats for some folks, keeping it warm until they come and you will recognize them and you will begin able to say, this is rightfully mine, but I see the anointing of God on you for it. Don't be surprised as God brings relationships to you that God's going to use those relationships with you so that you can promote others and that God can promote you Let's not be in places that we have relationships just because they serve 
our best interest. Let's have covenant relationships that benefit both parties to step into what they are called to be. Jonathan said, David, I'm going to help you get to where you're supposed to be. And God is calling us as kingdom people not to look at our work or our service place as somewhere that we have a crab mentality. You put a bunch of crabs in a bucket and they try to climb out, but they don't unless they pull the other one down. Oh no, that's not going to be us. Amen? God is situating you for promotion. Value and honor the relationships this year that God has brought into your life and you will see God bring you into a place of great promotion. I like that. Amen? Here's another one for you. Second Kings 20 and 20. Second Kings 20 and 20. It says, Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might, look at this, and how he made the pool and the conduit, and he brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Hezekiah, in this passage, it doesn't list all of his accolades. It doesn't tell us all the great things he done and how God helped him in his life for these things. It says two things, and it says these are important. You can go read the rest of them if you like. He said what Hezekiah here is known for is building a pool and creating a conduit so that the city could have water. Whoa! Glory to God! God in this year has anointed us to build pools and to create conduit so that the city, the state, and the nation could have an inflowing of the water of God like never before. People have been having to come on Sunday morning and dip a bucket in a well to try to get a little drink and they go home and say, man, the preacher helped me today. I got two swigs of water. And then they run out whenever they get home. There's an anointing on this house here this year to not just come drink at the well, but to build a pool to where conduits can flow from this house into every house in this city in this community, and in this state, so that the water of God will be in the house. Whoa! The water of God will be in the house. It won't just be, i got to go to the well. The well has come to my house. There's getting ready to be an outpouring. We're standing in it. We're in the middle of it. I don't want to speak future tense. I want to speak present tense. We are in the pool of God. We are in the water of God. And my friends, building the conduit is you. You are the conduit. You are the waterway of God. And out of your belly is going to begin to flow rivers of living water like never before. A well of God is springing up in you like never before. Don't cap the well. Don't dam up the river. Let God pour through you by His Spirit with signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit like never before. You are in the pool. The Holy Spirit is the water. You are the conduit. Don't shut it off. This year you're going to find yourself in peculiar places with peculiar people Ask it by God to do some peculiar things. Don't say, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Say, yes, Lord. Just say that out with me. Yes, Lord. This is a year of activating the body and calling the pool to begin to minister to the conduit. Whew. I hope this makes sense. See, what happens in here is not the move of God. The move of God doesn't happen till you take it out there. Amen. This is where the conduit gets fixed and positioned. 
The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 that God gives us apostles. He gives us prophets. He gives us evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. Yeah, it's not our job to do the stuff. It's your job to do the stuff. It's our job to equip you to do the stuff. And you're going to begin to see in this nation a great shift in the fivefold ministry. God gave me a word last night, and He said last night that you're going to begin to see a great exit of professional preachers. Those that have mega churches and they're in it for a profession and a retirement and a reputation, God is going to begin to shake those things and they're going to begin to disappear. And God's shifting His church out of these corrals or pens for sheep, if you would, and He's setting them down into a place to be distributed to the nations of the world. We're going to begin to see apostles, real apostles, rise up in this nation. Real prophets rise up in the nation. Real pastors, evangelists, and teachers rise up in the nation. And those that have called themselves those things and are not will begin to disappear. So the word of the Lord to you today is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Amen. Don't reject the apostolic and the prophetic just because it's been misunderstood and abused and you've seen the bad side of it, receive it into your life and allow Father to position it correctly so that you can be equipped to fulfill your assignment. Does that make sense? Hallelujah. Let me hurry up. Hezekiah was known for the pools and the conduit. This house is going to be known for the pools and the conduit. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to run to Neil or Greg or anybody else to get a release in what you need. You carry it in you. He's in you. The same God that's in us is in you. The same Spirit that's in us is in you. And you can do exactly what we do. We don't have to look and say, Neil, would you pray for me? Neil may come to you and say, hey, would you pray for me? Why? Because we are the body of Christ. And God has equipped us to be that conduit. 2 Samuel 20 and 20. 2 Samuel 20 and 20. It says, Joab replied. Look what Joab replied. Look what he said. He said, far be it. Far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. Joab said, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. We're entering into a season of time that God is going to empower you to be a greater giver instead of a greater taker. Joab could have swallowed things up and destroyed things. And the Scripture shows us that God sometimes doesn't bless us because we will consume it with our own lust. We'll just use it up and misuse it. God wants to bring us and shift us into a place of greater generosity. Whew. Hear me. In order to be generous, you need to be prosperous. In order to be a giver, you got to have something to give. Not just say, oh, well, I'd love to give, but I don't have anything to give. I don't have any more time. I don't have any more treasure. I don't have any more talent to give. I don't have anything to give, but if I had it, I'd give it. Let me tell you, God's getting ready to give seed to the sower. He's getting ready to bring things into your hand for the very specific reason of sowing it. Everybody say, sow it. I'm not just talking about finances. I'm talking about every aspect of your life. 
things that God brings into your life, into your hand, into your house, it all belongs to God. And the Father saying to us today, I want you to steward what I bring you, and if you will steward it well, I'll bring more into your life so that you can be a master over much because you've been faithful with the little. See, God's heart is never the seed. God's heart's not after the seed. But God puts seed in your hand. God's heart is about the harvest. He didn't say in His Word that the seeds were ripe. He said the harvest is ripe. That means something's been planted and the harvest is not ripe tomorrow. It's ripe today. And God wants to put seed in your hand so that you can sow for the harvest. God's desire is not in the seed in your hand, but it is in the harvest the seed in your hand will produce. you got to release the seed before you get the harvest. Amen? The harvest doesn't come to the farmer when he stands out on the edge of the field and he says, man, I'd love to have a harvest this year. I'm going to have a good harvest. It's going to be a green harvest. It's going to be a harvest so abundant. It's going to be so beautiful, so magnificent that my neighbors are going to be jealous of my harvest. And then he turns around and walks back to his house and does nothing. No, he has to put his hand to the plow. He has to hook the plow to the ass. And he has to begin to hit that thing with those with those reins and get it moving and digging pulling up roots and pulling up all the stones and letting the seed drop in the ground. And when he does that, the harvest begins to come far. Am I right? So God puts seed in your hand and it requires work to get it out of your hand. But when it's planted, God brings the rain. God's the one that gives the increase. The word of the Lord for us this year is God's going to bring much seed into your hand. Don't eat your seed. Don't eat the seed. Plant the seed. And let God bring the harvest that He desires into your life. Amen? We're not going to be people that destroy. We're not going to be people that consume. We're not going to be people that swallow things up. But we're going to allow Father to use us in a way that He can trust us in the city. There are hungry people here. God will bring more groceries than your skinny body can eat into your house so you can help your neighbor when there's nothing on his table. Amen? Come on, smile at me on Sunday morning. I love you guys. You're going to find more money in your bank account than what you need. Because your neighbor needs help. You may find more clothes in your closet than what you need. Because Father has need of it for somebody that needs a new shirt, a new pair of shoes, some kids that need clothes for school. You may find yourself with extra homes, extra cars, extra land, extra whatever it may be in your life. You think, man, I got it good. God said, uh, hello. Can I have my house back. I have need of it. And we have to be in a position to say, yes, Father, I hope I took care of it okay for you. And I hope whoever you want to have it is pleased and blessed with what you brought into my hand. And you be one that sows. I'm telling you, this city is looking for a generous church. They're looking for a people that are not takers, but they're givers. And I really believe that I'm seeing that God's going to empower this house to feed this city, to clothe this city, to build this city in such ways that the heathen would look at us and become jealous and want to know our God. Woo! Hallelujah! We're going to be generous people in a way that generosity has never been defined before. When they look up generous Neil in the dictionary, they'll see an asterisk there. It says, search for global connections. Woo! I'm excited today. What God is doing in you, He's recrowning you. He's putting a new crown on your life. Give me those next couple of slides really quick. Here's some very important things. You're not going, so you're going to stop living from a position of struggle and defeat.
And you're going to begin to live from a position of the victory of a risen Christ. You're not going to live out of lack. You're not going to live out of defeat. You're going to live out of the victory of the risen Christ. Can you say amen? Give me the next one. There it is. Write down Romans 5 and verse 17. Here is a powerful word for us. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. That's Adam. Much more those who receive, shall receive. Those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign, R-E-I-G-N, in life through the one of Jesus Christ. God wants to shift you from a poor Christian into a reigning king. Hallelujah! He wants to shift you from a church goer into a manifestation of ecclesia. Hallelujah! He's shifting you. Give me the next one real quick. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Your identity will be realized by how or who you are led by. Next slide, please. Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and these things will be added unto you. This is our priority. It says seek first. That word first is the word pro. Above all, before anything else, you must seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The next slide shows us how we are to pray in this year. It says in, in Matthew 6, 10, when we pray, we're to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're not praying, God, make my day better. God, make my life easier. God, give me more stuff. But we're praying, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can you say amen? I want you to realize that we're stepping into a decade that is like no other, and God has desired to use you in a way like you've never been used before. I want to pray over you today. I want to release some decrees over you today. We're going to be together a long time. I believe that. Amen. Decades. Hallelujah. Today, I feel to release a prophetic decree over you that's going to help us shift. Amen. How many of you are willing to shift? Amen. Eight of us. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Let's just stand on our feet for a moment. Lord, we bless you. Hallelujah. Father, we glorify You. Mm. Father, we thank You today for Your Word. That Your Word is alive and powerful. It changes us. It restructures us, Lord, in every capacity. And Father, today we submit ourselves to You just afresh and new. And Father, we ask You today that You would rightly align us where You desire us to be in Your kingdom. And Father, let us see it, let us know it, and help us to agree with it, even if it's something we're not excited about in the beginning. Today, Father, You've called this church, this group of people, to be a catalyst, a tip of the spear, forerunners, an apostolic prophetic people to help bring a shift, Lord God, in this community, in this state, and in this nation. And today, Father, we align ourselves with Your will. We thank You and we praise You, Father, for what You're calling us to and what You're releasing us into. And Father, we just ask today for a fresh infilling of Your Holy Spirit. Come on, just begin to pray today. Begin to pray in the Spirit. Begin to call out to the Lord this morning. Father, I decree over this house today that you're establishing, you're establishing order in their life today. You're, you're bringing things that have been out of order, out of joint, 
back into joy, back into order for release of power. Father, you're restoring identity in their life. You're bringing us out of all of those lies that have been spoken over our life, that have decreed to us who we were, and we were not that. And Lord, today you're releasing true, pure identity that's being deposited in your sons and in your daughters today that they are your children that you never leave them you never forsake them you've given them authority over the powers of hell over the powers of death over the powers of the grave father you've released within them your anointing father and i thank you today that it is rising up within them it is stirring up within them and it's being released within them father today I decree over everyone in here today that they are conduit that is hooked to the pool, connected to the pool, and your, your water, your kingdom, Father, is beginning to pour through them in ways like never before. In Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Your will be done, Lord. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come in our life, in our family, in our city, in our nation. Kingdom of God come. The kingdom of God does not come in word, but it comes in power. And the Lord says today to you that He's going to not only release His power through you, but He's going to deposit His power in you. We must become accustomed, familiar with the supernatural, with miracles. Come here, brother, my 87 year old friend. Whew. Turn around here, just stand beside me right here. You make Neil a young man. Isn't that good? God gave us a word last night about a toe. A toe. T-O-E. Not a T-O-W. Share that testimony you gave me this morning. Uh, my big toe has been sort of frozen. Steve, I haven't been able to bend it for three years. Yeah, I can bend it now. Isn't that awesome? With my shoes on. With his shoes on. Hallelujah. God's a healer. You may say, God's into big toe miracles. Yeah, he is. It's only a little toe, but it's a big toe. It's a big toe. You're a big man. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, if God will heal this brother's toe, he'll heal anything in your life that you need. Everything is important to God. You may say, I've learned to live with this thing. Doesn't matter. God don't want you living with it. Because God didn't give you sickness and disease. He didn't give you infirmity. He gave you healing and a life of health. If you're sick in your body today, I want you to step out of your seat and come up here. We're going to lay hands on you and believe God for miracles today. Come on. You're sick in your body? Come. Hallelujah. Tom, I want you and your wife to come up here with me. Neil and Nancy, come. Who are some of the other ministers you have that we use here in the church. Dave and Joe, amen. Well, if you're in line for healing, then when God heals you today, just turn around and begin to pray for folks. Amen? Praise God. I hear the Lord saying today that He's bringing a balance, a chemical balance in, one, in a lady's life today. Things have been out of whack, and God's bringing a chemical balance in your life today. Somebody here has been having a great problem with your pancreas. God's going to heal you this morning from that. We release that in the name of Jesus. So what we're going to do now, we're just going to start laying hands on you. And we're going to start praying over you and decreeing over you. And you just lift your hands and worship. Just receive the Lord this morning and what He's doing in your life. We may need some guys back here to help in case the Spirit of the Lord overpowers someone this morning. His kabod gets on them and they can't hold Him up. Hallelujah. That's all right too. So let's just lift our hands. Church, you're a part. Begin to pray in the Spirit and stretch your hands this way. And let's let God do this as a body ministry in Jesus' name. Any more instruction? Let's do it. Come on, guys. Lay your hands on them.